Hello, everyone. Well, as you know, my name is Andres Hacke, and I'm the director of the Advanced Architectural Design Program. And on behalf of the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation, uh, I am very happy to welcome here Lola Shepard, uh, architect, thinker, professor, and activist, I, I would say, and very well known as co-founder as well, of, uh, together with Mason White, of the Toronto-based architectural practice, Lateral Office. Lola Shepard's research work is placed at the intersection of architecture, infrastructures, climate, and politics. It characterizes architecture as both the result and an actor in the evolution of extended historical networks and environmental domains. For her, the role of the architects is not to solve problems, or not to solve simple problems, maybe, but rather render invisible the forces at work within a site-specific climate, climate and geography, and building up synergies between issues and opportunities, and all this with a very particular focus uh, on the context of the Arctic Canada that is uh, uh, attracting a big part of the work that uh, Lachal Office and herself have been developing in the last years. Lola is a registered architect, and she received her Bachelor of Science in Architecture and Bachelor of Architecture from McGill University, as well as a Master of Architecture from Harvard Graduate School of Design. She's an associate professor at the School of Architecture, University of Waterloo, where she also serves as the undergraduate office, officer. She has taught at the University of Toronto, Ohio State University, and California College of the Arts. Before funding uh, lateral office, uh, she worked in the offices of Jean Nouvel in Paris, Peter Rose in Cambridge, and Alison Morrison in London. She's the co-author of books that have been incredibly uh, influential, uh, and very influential here, uh, especially. Uh, uh, she's the co-author uh, co of Pamphlet Architecture Number no. 30, titled Copeland, Strategies for Infrastructural Opportunism, published by Princeton Architectural Press in 2011. She's been co-editor of the second issue of Bracket, titled Ghost Soft, published by Akhtar in 2012, and Bracket and Extremes in 2013. Uh, her work has been uh, often a word, I would say. She's the recipient of the 2012 Reich Young Architects Award and the 2003 and 2004 Howard Lefebvre Fellowship from Ohio State University. In a recent conversation with Hans Sivelins, she claimed, if you really want to engage with the issues at hand, you have to examine the larger economic and infrastructural system to see where architecture might intervene. I still remember the impact that it had in, in many people, and in me in particular, uh, Lateral's office contribution to the 2018 Seoul Biennial of Architecture and Urbanism. Their project, States of this Assembly, composed by a collection of impressive models and drawings, uh, proposed seven forms of architecture techno-commons to collectively manage electronic waste. Lateral Office defines its mission as the exploration of architectural design as a research vehicle to engage with climate, with the societal, with the ecological and the political. The recent work and research focus on the way design mediates the relationships between public realm, infrastructure, and environment. Lateral Office has been awarded with the 2016 National Urban Design Award, with the 2013 Progressive Architecture Award. In 2011, they received the Holcim Foundation for Sustainable Construction Gold Award and the Emerging Voices Award from the Architectural League of New York. Please join me in welcoming uh, Lola Shepard tonight. Thank you for that very kind uh, introduction. It's. Um, Lovely to be here. Uh, I haven't uh, I haven't ha had the pleasure of being here for a while. Uh, I came recently for reviews, and it was it was lovely to see some of the work happening. Um, so I wanted to use um, the lecture to position some arguments about the territories um, that architects might operate in, both intellectually um, and physically, and the agency by which they might do so. Um, so I'm going to spend about 
eight minutes or 10 minutes um, sort of positioning um, a set of ideas that have shaped some of our work and then um, spend the remaining time presenting a range of design research projects and installations. So, um, so there's a long uh, history of projecting the direction of our discipline. Um, disciplinarity has traditionally been about knowledge production, but it was Foucault who first called attention to the discipline um, as an, a system of control in the production of discourse. Um, English scholars Shumway and Messi Davidao unpack the historical lineage of disciplinarity, articulating the common connotations of discipline have until recently been entirely positive. To call a branch of knowledge discipline is to imply that it is rigorous and legitimate. However, we regulate and control knowledge, and training in disciplines produces the acceptance of certain disciplinary methods and truths. Interestingly, many of the metaphors that we use to talk about the idea of discipline are geographical ones. We talk about territories, fields, frontiers. Um, and um, it's been noted um, that the intellectual ecosystem has, with time, been carved up into separate institutional and professional niches whose boundaries reinforce different goals, different methods, and different expertise. Disciplines differ significantly with regard to the permeability of their boundaries. And many scholars would say that the permeability is a sort of measure um, of the kind of coherence and uniformity demanded of, of uh, a discipline's practitioners. And so when we speak of discipline, um, we don't speak simply about a body of knowledge, but also a set of practices by which that knowledge is acquired, confirmed, implemented, and and reproduced. And I'll come back to this idea of sort of the practices um, uh, by which we make work um, later. Architecture since the 1960s has been active in borrowing from other disciplines, although it's not clear to me how much that borrowing is reciprocated, um, whether other disciplines are as fascinated uh, by us as we are by them. Um, but of course, you know, people like Charles Jenks in um, his famous diagram from 1971, Architecture 2000s, uh, 2000 Predictions and Methods, was, was precisely that, a sort of trying to chart um, the lineages of architecture, um, the, where it had come from, and where um, it might be leading. And I think this, this sort of fascination for charting where we are going um, uh, is, is, is part of what motivates many of us. Um, Although the tug between the interior-oriented and exterior-oriented design uh, persists, I would say that probably since the 1990s, we've seen a general momentum towards the discipline's exteriority. Um, various versions of disciplinary transgression exist. We talk about multi, inter, intra, post-disciplinarity, and perhaps the most robust, the idea of transdisciplinary. Um, transdisciplinary research responds, um, as one scholar pointed out, to the observation that the world has problems Problems, but universities have departments, suggesting that disciplinary, transdisciplinary work is oriented towards sort of solving more complex issues um, that require multiple bodies of knowledge. There continues to be, um, and, I, and I think we see it um, particularly in schools, this kind of uh, exciting interbreeding among design and spatial disciplines, combinations of architecture, landscape, ecology, urbanism, engineering, material science, fabrication, um, have offered fodder in the last two dec decades for new disciplinary pursuits, and in some cases, the launching even of new academic programs. Um, this has yielded an opportunity for considering the expanded field for the design disciplines. The notion of the expanded field, of course, was introduced um, in many ways by Rosalind Krauss's famous diagram from 1979 and her essay, um, where she tried to sort of map out new understandings of sculptural practice. Um, and this, this sort of diagram in that discourse um, had, had a, a huge impact, I would say, uh, on architects as well. And so, Perhaps in a kind of homage to Krauss, um, uh, in our book, um, Coupling, um, th that came out in 2011, we attempted to sort of chart um, an expanded field uh, for architecture that in some ways was provoked um, by this sort of renewed interest in infrastructure um, of which we were part and, and many other uh, practices were sort of expanding the sort of boundaries um, uh, of the discipline. Um, and, and so it began with this question of how one 
uh, position infrastructure uh, within the, that, of course, is not traditionally um, understood as a, a sort of uh, within the realm of architects. Um, and so we then mapped out a, a kind of range of things that were outside. So the idea of infrastructure, program container, civic conduit, productive surface, and that in some ways architecture was all these um, all these sort of hybrid conditions. Um, and so um, it, it, it begs the question of what are these sort of other environments which uh, architecture might engage in? Um, and for us, um, in some ways it has been um, this interest in the kind of extrinsic forces um, that shape architecture, the ecologies, the energies, the economies, the flows of people, goods, and networks, which one might understand as velocities, um, that in some ways we're interested in, in the sort of things um, at the very sort of exterior perimeter um, that come to shape architecture. Um, and much of our work has focused on uh, regions where architecture radically confronts geography, territory, and climate, places where the very notion of site needs to be redefined. And so it's often been in the non-urban, the remote, the rural, the far-flung. And our interest in these places is that um, in these contexts, there, there's often no model for architecture. There is no model for public realm. And so the rules of engagement have to basically be, um, I don't want to say invented, but have to be teased out through intense research because there is no sort of given model that you can refer to. Um, and so, it, it, as I say, it, it demands extensive research, um, and it demands also a kind of shift from merely studying site and architecture as precedent to this sort of broader understanding of larger forces. So, um, if one looks outside the discipline, um, it, it sort of I think part of our interest is in, um, as Andre said, um, expanding the sort of agency of architecture. And it's done not to avoid the particularities of the discipline, but rather to expand and clarify the questions and ultimately the agency that it can have. Um, and so how might one uh, work in this way. We've, we've started to talk about the idea of the undisciplined um, as a counter to um, not so much being uh, transdisciplinary or antidisciplinary, but to look um, and learn from these sort of, uh, from an expanded field of questions to come back to the discipline and to use um, the methods we have trained as architects or planners or architects as the form of response. So the idea is to sort of uh, find the answers within the discipline, but to uh, perhaps find the questions outside of it. Um, a century ago, Gropius tasked the architect in the scope of total architecture to understand design and fabrication processes in order to combine, uh, quote, the qualities of an artist, a technician, and a businessman. Um, he sort of aspired to be able to design the fork, the chair, the building, and the city. And he advocated against specialization. He argued that good architecture should be a project of life itself. And that implies an intimate knowledge of the biological, the social, the technical, and artistic processes. Problems. In some ways, the sort of renewed interest that we're seeing in landscape and urbanism and fabrication and material research, um, architects sort of share this kind of desire um, for, you know, in some cases a kind of total scope or in others perhaps simply a kind of expanded scope. Um, the risk, one might say, is that. Um, it leaves architects in a kind of tenuous position. Are we left as sort of a jack of all trades and master of none? Um, and I think that um, uh, I, I would counter that um, uh, that the the answer uh, lies in perhaps rethinking the role of the architect. Um, and so what's interesting, when you look up the definition um, of the architect, or an ar what is an architect, um, you get the more conventional, a person who designs buildings and in many cases supervises their construction, a person who's responsible for inventing or realizing a particular idea or project, and then at least the Merriam-Webster dictionary gives related words. And for me, this is where it gets interesting. Builder, maker, producer, captain, director, handler, leader, quarterback, contriver, formulator, spawner, arranger, hatcher, planner, plotter, schemer, finagler, um, which seems so much more interesting, I have to say. <laughs> um, and I, I think this idea um, 
of, of expanding the sort of scope uh, of how we even understand our role is really interesting. And so the question is, who might be uh, role models? And for us, um, and, and there, there could be a, a, a far expanded uh, list, but um, you know, I think people like both Minister Fuller, who had this sort of amazing ability to think um, at an almost global scale. He invented, you know, his own field of um, synergetics. Um, he developed the idea of the world game as a kind of method for sort of asking these huge questions. People like Cedric Price, um, who were able to sort of think uh, about questions of infrastructure and economics um, and economic economic cycles, um, and also then tapping into kind of uh, what was happening in terms of um, uh, uh, science and computers as, as sort of uh, fodder for rethinking what architecture could be. Um, people like Doxiadis, um, who's perhaps uh, b both more literally a planner, but also had this kind of amazing ability to understand planning um, within broader understandings of culture and economics. Um, and then more contemporarily, um, I think someone like Keller Easterling, who really um, invokes architects to uh, sort of understand the kind of hidden forces that shape our profession. Um, inadvertently and to kind of reclaim control for at least understanding those systems. So um, having, I guess the sort of um, last question is what might be the methods by which one engages in this sort of expanded territory and expanded agency? Um, and we found, um, I guess, a few things that, that sort of motivate how we work. Um, one is we're interested in questions which intertwine territory, environment, and typology. We use research to uncover the social, cultural, and economic forces which shape a spatial phenomena. We seek out overlooked potentials, and we use drawings to spatialize phenomena that have yet to be documented. And we have found that often the answer lies not in a single solution, but emerges from multiple possibilities. So I'm going to show uh, uh, several projects, and hopefully some of this will um, maybe, maybe become clearer uh, in terms of, of the intent. So the first project um, uh, is the States of Disassembly, Territory Toxicity and Electronics, which um, Andres mentioned, um, which we developed for the Seoul Biennale in uh, 2017. Um, and the theme of the Biennale was uh, imminent commons. Um, and of course, a commons is uh, typically understood to, to describe international, supranational, and global resources. Um, and they often make reference to the world, sort of the Earth's natural resources, such as the oceans, the atmosphere, um, outer space. The Antarctic is sort of uh, uh, well known as a kind of global com commons. Um, but in the context of the Biennale, they expanded to include questions of sensing, communicating, moving, making, and recycling. And so um, we got interested in the idea of recycling and then more particularly the idea of e-waste given that of course um, it was Korea and uh, Korea is a, a major producer of electronics. Um, and what, what we began to observe is that um, we live, uh, or, or our sort of territories are made up of three primary uses, sites of production, consumption, and waste. And so of course we're most familiar with the sites of consumption. Um, the places where we live, where we play, where we work. Um, and the city is the primary site of consumption. However, the sites of extraction, production, and uh, post-consumption, so, i.e. waste, are the things that are generally outside of our, uh, out, out of view and on the periphery of where we inhabit. Um, and Jen Jennifer Gabris in her book, Digital Rubbish, uh, makes this sort of poignant comment, the digital revolution, it turns out, is littered with rubbish. Um, and so um, we got interested in understanding uh, the sort of geopolitics, socioeconomics, and logistics behind this. Um, and the first thing was to understand what was e-waste. And so um, e-waste is not simply your phone or your uh, computer. It's your fridge. It's your microwave. It's uh, your, uh, f you know, your um, uh, stove, probably. We have electronics in. Um, 
um, most of our devices. And um, they're filled with um, actually fairly uh, valuable rare earth metals um, whose, whose value is high enough to still make it worth uh, recycling. And so we set out to kind of understand what was this kind of global flow um, of uh, resources that go into the production and then the making and then the recycling of these materials. So um, the red are this, uh, the, the blue, sorry, are the sites of extraction um, of, of gold, of copper, of platinum, et cetera. And the pink are um, the sites of um, waste uh, recycling. So the thing to note is that there's only um, one or two sites in the sort of Western or uh, developed world that actually can accommodate uh, e-waste recycling, Korea being actually one of the few. And so, although it's actually technically illegal by UN conventions, we still ship our e-waste um, to uh, developing nations um, where it's done, uh, where it's recycled in kind of highly uncontrolled and toxic ways, and is basically producing a kind of toxic colonialism. Um, and so the, the, actually, I'll go back for one moment. Um, so the primary sites um, for recycling uh, are in China, in uh, Karachi, in Pakistan, and in uh, um, Ghana. And so one of these sites is uh, Agbo, Agbo Bloshi in Ghana. Um, and you, um, this was a drawing done by someone else, but um, you see the kind of whole territory um, uh, given over to e-waste recycling. But what's amazing at the, is is that there's a kind of entire city growing out. So you have mosques and churches and football pa pa uh, patches um, and public baths. And so the question is, you know, what might be the public realm that would emerge if we were actually to sort of take responsibility for this e-waste um, rather than uh, offload it to other nations? And this is this public, well, this, I wouldn't call it public realm. This is the sort of landscape that emerges um, in Ghana um, at the site of this e-waste uh, production. So we made this sort of drawing that in some ways conflates uh, the many sites that contribute to uh, e-waste uh, production. So sites of extraction, sorry, I should, I'll use my pointer, sites of extraction, uh, smelters, um, uh, sort of uh, proper e-waste uh, recycling, the informal e-waste, um, as, as simply kind of trying to map out this sort of landscape uh, that emerges. And in some ways, we were interested in asking what might be the new buildings, the new uh, landscapes that might emerge um, in this sort of uh, repatriated sort of uh, ecology and economy um, of e-waste. So, um, we began in, in, in the spirit of recycling. Uh, we decided to uh, recycle a lot of electronics. So we went to our uh, local uh, computer depot and uh, hacked apart computers and keyboards and hard drives. Um, and then we sort of neutralized them um, and, and uh, wanted to kind of incorporate them in this sort of spirit of recycling. Like, could one start to understand, understand them as part of the architecture? Um, and so um, I, I said in my last point uh, of, of sort of methods, um, this interest in um, sometimes there's m the answer lies not in a single solution but in many. Um, we've perhaps uh, I was going to say unintentionally, but I think it's actually fairly intentional. Um, you'll see that many of the projects uh, today, um, we deliberately actually develop many, many sort of responses to, to a question. Um, and it's partly in recognizing that these questions are so complex that no single design problem will, will sort of um, produce a kind of satisfying response. Um, so we developed, in this case, seven projects um, uh, at, that were really uh, demonstrated purely through model, um, in addition to those drawings I showed earlier. Um, and so I'm going to show just three of them very quickly um, uh, to, to kind of give you a sense of some of the things we were interested in. So the first one is called the Exchange Campus. Um, and it was this idea of a kind of current, uh, that the current global e-waste stream is dependent on the constant movement and shipping of e-waste. And so we were interested um, 
in, uh, in locating a kind of exchange campus at the site of a port just before this e-waste gets distributed out to the world. Um, and that there would be uh, one side that would be um, for, for disassembly, for storage, and then the other side, which would be a sort of new kind of university or campus uh, with courtyards and classrooms and disassembly stations um, where new sort of uh, knowledges of, of, um, of making uh, electronics might emerge. Um, so you see here this kind of uh, spine um, that separates the sort of side that is uh, the storage and, and kind of infrastructural port condition and then these sort of uh, educational buildings and classrooms and uh, uh, workshops that would um, sit on the other side. Um, and here's one of the, the sort of electronic pieces um, now understood as... Um, a lab building. Um, the second uh, project uh, was called the We Market, um, and it was a play off the sort of idea of our big boxes, and in particular things like Best Buy, where we go to buy, uh, you know, new electronics. Um, and we were interested in could one imagine a kind of alternate Best Buy um, where one would go to uh, buy components uh, for that were repurposed um, uh, of, of post-consumer uh, materials. And so it was, it was really a, a kind of idea on the play of the big box. Um, so there was a sort of loading zone, an entry point. There was a kind of conveyor belt that is sort of hidden under here um, where goods would be moved about. Um, uh, and then, and then uh, uh, zones for public display. And then the third project um, that was part of this series uh, we called the Theater of Disassembly. Um, and it was playing off the sort of rise of hacker culture, um, the fascination in personal robotics and electronics, um, a little bit of the sort of hoarders, uh, 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 what is it called, reality TV as well. Um, and the idea that the Theater of Disassembly would be a place uh, where under one roof you could have um, sort of varying aspects of sort of post-consumer uh, electronic entertainment. Um, and so it was imagined as a series of stages and venues where you could have hacking ba battles, uh, demo classes, disassembly events. Um, and so here you see these sort of uh, four um, uh, theaters for disassembly um, that are hung in, in, in this kind of uh, grid, uh, grid-like space um, and, and that then on the ground floor was the space um, for storing all the e-waste. So the kind of public was immediately brought up through a set of platforms into these, this sort of um, performance space and the ground floor was left as a kind of logistical space. Um, so of course these projects are not meant as uh, literal solutions. They're, they're really meant, um, I think as, as Andre very accurately uh, said, uh, they, they ask questions. They're partly saying, what are the things we're overlooking? What are the kind of untapped programmatic opportunities, typological opportunities um, that, that emerge when one looks at something that begins as a kind of intense global network, but, but ultimately uh, materializes in um, storage silos, in uh, you know, vaults uh, for rare earths, in disassembly buildings, um, in, in warehouses, in, in port buildings, etc. So the second um, project that I want to show um, is a, a long-term uh, project that we've been involved in called Many Norths uh, and that materialized in a book uh, by the same uh, title uh, that came out in 2017. And part of our fascination um, with the North, as I say, is that um, there is no model for, for what to do in this context. And, we got interested because, of course, most of our images, certainly probably yours and even in Canada, the north is, you know, the polar bears and the glaciers. Um, but what you realize is there are people living there and they are um, tethered by infrastructures and networks, um, but always in this sort of intense dialogue with climate and geography. 
So the striking thing about the Canadian North is you have 115,000 people, probably barely a New York, New York borough, spread over 5 million square kilometers. It's probably half the land mass of the United States. Um, and you have these tiny um, dispersed communities, um, many of which are not connected by road, so the only way you can get to them is by uh, plane or by boat. Um, you also have, particularly in the Eastern Arctic, so this would be the sort of what one would call the kind of Eastern Arctic, um, an incredibly young population. It's the fastest growing population per capita in Canada. Um, um, I believe that 50% of the population is under the age of 25, which is kind of mind-blowing. Um, and so you have these youth that are on the one hand going out hunting with their elders, and then on the other hand on Facebook and listening to hip-hop. Um, and so they're producing this kind of amazing hybrid culture of tradition and modernity. Um, and they're sort of a testament to how resilient a culture it is. Um, it's also a place um, where modernity has really been uh, foisted uh, upon an indigenous people. Um, we've always sort of loved this photo. It's a, a building by a Quebec architect um, who I had the pleasure of interviewing. Um, he built several of these kind of crazy lunar schools. Um, and then you have these sort of young Inuit youth of the 70s, um, you know, dressed in, in the kind of style of the day. And this conflation of sort of uh, different, different notions of modernity in this kind of um, intense landscape is fascinating. It's also a place where we've imposed, I mean, I say we, Southern Canada, have imposed um, models of architecture, language, education, um, and, and usually with uh, tremendous uh, social and cultural harm. Um, and, whoops, sorry. Um, and, and then simultaneously, there's this kind of amazing sort of hybridization of culture and technology. So they still go out hunting on the land, but they now have uh, snowmobiles and GPS, um, and, and, and they're, they're sort of fearless in their willingness to um, combine these sort of worlds. Um, so the, the book was, was, in a way, the product of uh, five or six years of research um, and um, in a way sought to kind of uh, challenge both how architecture has been documented in the North, which to a large degree it hasn't really, but it has largely been a sort of technological understanding of architecture, but I think more broadly to perhaps challenge architects, um, regardless of the context, to kind of expand the things that they look at, the, the tools um, that we might employ to document um, phenomena. Um, so the, the research was organized um, in, in five uh, themes and chapters, uh, urbanism, architecture, mobility, monitoring, both military and um, uh, research monitoring and resources. Um, and we were, we were interested in the idea of um, a kind of multitude of voices and a multitude of methods for documenting this complex environment. Um, so we made, um, actually I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll go back to this. Um, and, and so that there were several kind of influences um, that, that came from outside of architecture. One is um, Glenn Gould's um, idea of the North. Um, Glenn Gould was actually a famous uh, pianist, but he did these amazing recordings um, where he would interview people in the North, um, and he would overlay their sort of stories and narratives so that it, it is somewhere between a kind of musical score and voices come in and out of uh, focus in this kind of recording. But it's this idea that it, there are multiple narratives, and each person has a very different understanding of the North. Um, the second influence, um, which I'll expand on in a minute, um, was a geographer uh, from Quebec called uh, Louis Edmond Amelin, um, who talked about um, Canadian Nordicity, and he famously said there are many Norths in this North, and I'll come back to this. Um, and then a third influence was um, the famous film uh, by Zacharias Canuck, Atanarjouak, The Fast Runner, um, which is the only Inuk film to have won a Palme d'Or at Cannes, um, which really speaks to kind of indigenous ingenuity um, in, in, in the face of kind of climate um, and, and how culture adapts. 
So Amla, uh, the, the, the title of our book, Many Norths, comes from this statement, there are many Norths in the North. And he uh, was interested in trying to kind of quantify quite scientifically uh, different Norths based on a set of polar values that had to do with economics, infrastructure, uh, access to resources, et cetera. Which, and I won't get into it too much, but he created these kind of different uh, qualities of North. Um, what's also interesting is that he talked about the idea of places getting denortified, that as as they developed economically, they might lose their northern qualities, um, which raises this interesting question of, you know, is geography sort of in the eye of the beholder? Um, so we set out early on to kind of define uh, the idea of north uh, in our own terms. So you can understand it in terms of political terms, so our three northern provinces. You can understand it in terms of um, ethnographic regions. You can understand it in terms of where the tree line ends where the permafrost ends, or begins, I should say. Um, permafrost is where the ground is permanently frozen, and so it changes fundamentally how you build. Um, you could define it by the ecozone. You could define it by where the roads end. You could define it, as I'm landed, in this idea of a middle north, far north, and extreme north. Um, and you're left with this perplexing question um, that there is no singular north, and that each, uh, depending on what you're looking at, um, the, the, the territory may need to get redefined. Um, so as part of these kind of multiple ways of trying to document the context, we made timelines that introduce each chapter that try and understand policy and innovations and events. Um, at the end of the book, uh, instead of a sort of typical uh, index, we actually have a sort of tech matrix which um, sort of includes all the sort of technologies from perk planes to hammers to buildings um, where architecture is understood as merely one technology among many for inhabiting the north. So I'm going to show you a, a few uh, case studies um, to try and give you a sense of, of um, some of the things we were interested in. So the first, um, in, in the category of urbanism, we looked at the question of landform. Um, and so we've, we've actually documented because we must be compulsive, every single town uh, north of 60, um, and, and, and try to kind of unpack um, their morphology and what gave them shape. And so some, for instance, are really defined by extraordinary geography, um, which forces communities to sort of hug the, the coast um, in this kind of highly concentrated linear way. Um, in other cases, um, communities are, are navigating this kind of crazy pockmarked landscape um, and actually end up with this sort of strange dispersed uh, condition as they negotiate geography. And what's interesting is many of these communities with climate change are actually, the land is eroding so severely that entire towns need to be relocated. Um, and this is happening in Alaska as well. Um, in, in mobility, we set out to understand things like sea lift, um, which is the, the means by which goods are delivered. So if you live um, in Iqaluit, which is the capital of Nunavut, and you want a sofa bed from Ikea, you get it once a year in October when the boat comes to deliver it. Um, or if you want dog food, or you want um, you know anything that's more than perishable goods, it's all delivered by sea lift. So we set out to kind of understand um, where the southern points of kind of connection were, um, what the routes were. Um, and so you'll see that in every case study, there's always a kind of regional scale map. And then um, there's often a kind of calendar. Um, and then there's this kind of zooming in to understand what it means at the local. So, um, so the reality is that most of these communities don't have a proper port, so you have to dock the boat in the middle of the bay, and then with a second boat, you have to go back and forth, and it takes four days when it should take a couple of hours. Um, and so here are these barges bringing in these sea cans of goods that will keep them going through the whole year. Um, and many of these sea cans end up left in the communities, and then they get repurposed as uh, sort of workshops and storage. So they become inadvertently part of the urban fabric. Um, in mon in um, mobility and monitoring, we also looked at indigenous practices such as the Inuit trails. Um, we leveraged the work of an anthropologist who had been mapping with elders um, the Inuit trails um, to, to sort of understand the network. Um, so in this case, so one of the things is that in most of this is not our own field work. Each, each of these drawings is probably someone's entire PhD dissertation, and so there's no way we could cover the scope of things we wanted to cover. 
But part of what we saw our role is, is in trying to spatialize things that others may write about or describe verbally, but that no one actually has spatialized. And the argument is that if we can spatialize it, then we can potentially factor it into design thinking. So, oh, sorry, oops. I'm going to go back one, two. Um, so the Inuit have this kind of amazing way of navigating the land using topography and ridges. And um, they basically read the land like a map. They have um, many different terms for understanding kinds of snow uh, and the landforms produced. We looked at what they um, pack on a, on a trip um, and all the tools and equipment. Um, we looked at monitoring uh, at a kind of huge scale, something like the Dew Line, um, which is the set of uh, military bases that were built by the Americans in northern Canada during the Cold War. Um, uh, and, and so the, the map one typically finds, uh, some, you know, one finds some version of this, which is the many dots uh, where there were radars, some manned, some unmanned. Um, but those dots actually were places uh, with very specific geographies, um, with a, a whole set of buildings. In some cases, there were up to 80 people that would stay there for a whole year. They had theaters and cinemas, and often they sowed the seeds of future northern communities. Um, they, they were sort of, it, and I should say, it was actually the biggest building construction project ever undertaken uh, virtually in the world. The amount of uh, goods and materials required to kind of build these uh, 35 or more uh, military outposts was mind boggling. Um, so they developed kind of building types. Um, and, and there are these sort of crazy infrastructures that remain, many are being dismantled, um, a few uh, remain in, in kind of unmanned operation, but, but they, they come with a kind of architecture and uh, culture um, that is embedded. And so here's one of these now in, in a state of disrepair. And then the last case study that I'll show you um, was um, taken, is taken from the chapter looking at resources. So we looked at diamond mining and things like the crazy engineering required for that. But then we also looked at um, a, a kind of amazing practice uh, done in northern Quebec. So this is kind of the tip of, of uh, Quebec uh, in the Hudson's Bay, um, where they muscle, where they go hunting for mussels. And so in the uh, summer, they harvest the mussels by the coast. And in the winter, when the bay is frozen, they go out um, on the land. So what's amazing is um, the, the ocean uh, or the bay becomes a kind of frozen ice shelf. Um, and there is a tide of about 40 feet um, that comes and goes. So they uh, dig a hole in the ice. Um, they take their sled and use it as a ladder. And they basically crawl under the ice ceiling. Um, and they harvest the mussels. Um, and then they come back out. And they have to do this all um, within about a three hour time span. Um, so this is the kind of architecture of the landscape uh, when the water is down. Um, the people stay on top to kind of let them know if the tides are coming back because you would drown, so they have to move quickly. This is a photo, um, not ours, um, of, a, of an elder uh, and his grandson harvesting these mussels, which are considered a delicacy. And, so what's, what's fascinating um, for us is not all these projects lead to, or not all this documentation, of course, leads to architecture, but it, but it is this argument that um, these are part of the things that are shaping indirectly the kind of physical environments, the places people go, the way they navigate and understand the land. Um, and so if, if we can expand the things we look at and document, um, as I said, we, we can sort of um, change perhaps the, the things we include in design thinking. So I'm going to show one project um, that, that actually preceded the book but uh, was happening in parallel with much of the research. Um, it's called the Arctic Food Network. Um, and uh, it began with um, an, a sort of uh, much has been written about um, there's huge food insecurity in the north. So you have um, incredibly high cost of food. Um, so a food basket is like what you need to sort of uh, survive. You know, so your, here it would be your the cost of for a month of bread and milk and cheese and so forth. Um, and so what you see is, you know, in Norway, northern Norway, the cost of food of your monthly salary is a mere, I don't know, 16 percent. And none of it, it's 15. 55%. So you have the highest rates of unemployment in the country and the highest costs of food and a kind of loss of traditional knowledge of going out hunting um, and so forth. 
Um, and what, what's happening is there's a kind of importation of southern food, and so there's high rates of obesity um, and uh, diabetes and so forth. So we were interested not in, you know, uh, there's no going back, they will continue to eat southern food, but could one, um, was there a place where architecture could intervene to somehow uh, redress the balance a little bit? Um, so we looked at what were the kind of food resources uh, that they have, what they call country food or traditional food. Um, we set out to understand the kind of infrastructures that they currently use to store food, so community freezers. There are a few greenhouses, hunting cabins, underground freezers that are actually dug into the ice um, and then wayfinding means. Um, and so these are some of the cabins. These are further south. You wouldn't get them at this density um, in the far north. Um, these are these kind of amazing underground freezers that were dug by hand back in the day. Um, there's country food markets. There's such a demand for country food that there are sort of informal uh, country food markets where people trade things they've hunted. Um, but as you can see, there's no, no infrastructure for it to happen. Um, and then the kind of practice of going out on the land and hunting and sharing with the community. Um, so this was the work of this anthropologist I mentioned um, that had mapped out the Inuit trails and where they've historically gone. And then this is us mapping all the kind of resources, uh, food resources from meat to seafood to plants and berries that they eat. Um, and what we started to do is map out where the food was, where the communities were, which are the dots, and where the trails were, which came from the anthropologist's map. Um, and what we were interested in is, could one imagine a kind of system of trade and exchange that would increase the kind of access to um, country food um, such that you could, you could have greater access over longer durations. Um, so the idea is that if one town, for instance, had access to caribou and another to Arct Arctic char, could they trade? Um, and so we imagine this as a kind of what we called a kind of Arctic network or Arctic highway, um, uh, which could grow uh, incrementally. You could begin by building uh, infrastructure at one hub and progressively it could expand as needed. Um, and no uh, hub was further than a three or four hour snowmobile ri ride away. So it was po possible to kind of go from one node to the next. Um, and so we developed a kind of kit of parts um, that included uh, community kitchens, greenhouses, uh, ice fishing huts, storage, uh, aquaculture meshes, um, et cetera. And the idea was to, you know, we recognized we couldn't possibly know what individual communities needed. And so if one could imagine a kit of parts, communities could tell us, well, we'd like, we'd like a community kitchen and a storage uh, facility. Someone else might want a, um, a, an outpost or um, wayfinding uh, 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 for Wi-Fi, uh, which is a huge issue when people go navigating out on the land. So we started to kind of create a calendar of uh, the dark is what's currently accessible, and the hatch is how we imagined you could extend the sort of access uh, to food, uh, to a food group, and, and where the sort of infrastructures might um, offer uh, this greater access through greenhouses would extend growing seasons or um, places to smoke uh, fish where you could store it for longer, et cetera. So this was one of these sort of outposts, uh, a collection of sort of several of these buildings. Um, and so in a town, you might have a larger cluster of a kind of greenhouse, a shared market, and a community kitchen. Um, out, out further on the land, uh, in between a, two communities, you might have a kind of shed and a kitchen. Um, and one of the things we were interested in is not simply a kind of cultural hybridization, but also a technological one. And so we were interested in, um, could you on the one hand use very simple lumber, um, on the other hand use sort of CNC joints that would allow you to kind of assemble frames fairly easily. Uh, on the one hand, could you use uh, the kind of tradition of snowpack walls to allow um, insulation in the winter and ventilation in the summer, um, but then on a kind of higher tech end, and could you um, uh, 
uh, imagine installing solar panels, which is already happening in many buildings in the north, um, to allow um, access to kind of Wi-Fi and so forth. So this idea of merging sort of traditional um, and contemporary methods, um, also interested in kind of traditional assembly methods. So when they make their sleds, they actually tie them rather than nailing them. And so we were interested in, um, could that practice get incorporated? So this was the interior view of one of these community kitchens. Um, uh, and, and really, I mean, one of the things in the north, at least in Canada, in the Canadian north, um, is the only discussion is how quickly and cheaply can you build it. Um, and the idea that, cult, that architecture could be something that is a kind of tool of cultural empowerment, that it sort of marks place and marks community is um, almost not part of the discussion. And so for us, this is what, whoops, sorry, some of these uh, structures could hopefully do. The other thing we were interested in was the, the logistics, so um, how you could bring it out onto the land given that there are no roads, how you could assemble it fairly easily with a few people, um, what were the kind of, uh, and then the last thing was the sort of the economics of this. So um, in a current model, we import food and the further north you go, the more expensive it is. And so we were interested, could this sort of uh, architecture be entrepreneurial and actually generate a kind of microeconomy where on the one hand you could trade things locally but you might even export some of these things to the south um, and create sort of small-scale employment. So some of this work, um, I'm not going to get through all of it, but um, uh, got sort of materialized in our submission for the Venice Biennale in 2014 um, that was called Arctic Adaptations, Nunavut at 15. Um, and, um, uh, and, and, and I, I don't want to really talk about it in too much detail, um, but we were interested in how could you document the kind of past, present, and future um, of this territory, which is uh, transforming so rapidly. So um, there were um, sort of three components. Um, the first was a set of carvings. Um, and so we had sort of selected seminal buildings um, that had shaped the Canadian North, um, either because they were significant icons or because they were housing prototypes that were deployed you know, by the hundreds across communities. Um, and then we worked with Inuit carvers, or we didn't work with, we, we um, developed workshops with Inuit carvers um, and had them do these, these sort of amazing sculptures of these buildings. Um, so each, each carving is done by a different sculptor in uh, various communities across the north. Um, for the present day condition, we wanted to kind of create a sort of bas-relief map of every community um, in Nunavut. So we made these um, sort of Corian shields um, that marked geography um, and mapped every single building. So we, we've actually literally constructed every, or, or, or modeled every single building in Nunavut. Um, um, uh, to, to understand the kind of spatial patterns um, of these communities, um, and we called these the kind of moons of Nunavut. Um, and then the sort of projective component uh, was done working with students in schools across Canada, um, looking at questions like housing. This was uh, a project done with students at U of T, um, where we projected on um, uh, um, sort of, we, we made maps at various scales, so regional, uh, local, et cetera, and everything that was dynamic and ephemeral uh, was, was projected on through a set of videos, um, so climate, snow, ice, uh, people's movements, snowmobile trails, et cetera, um, would get mapped on um, uh, sort of digitally. Do I have time for one? Okay, so I'll close with one, um, last project uh, called Making Camp, which was uh, developed actually for the Chicago Biennale. The Biennales have been very productive for us. Uh, they, they offer very good deadlines. Um, uh, that was um, looking at the idea of uh, camping as a sort of cultural phenomena, um, and, and also embracing this idea of the kind of domesticated wilderness. Um, and it began with the sort of famous uh, uh, Rainer Banham uh, sort of observation about how we shape environment. And he talks about in the architecture of the well-tempered environment um, that there are two ways that we sort of shape our environment. One is um, the, the sort of metaphor, the model of the campfire, um, where we basically, uh, by producing heat, generate 
great comfort and, and that acts as a kind of uh, force of attraction um, to, um, and that the desirable zone is right near the campfire and that of course the less desirable zone is in the tailwinds. The other model um, is that of the tent, um, which is really one of shielding, of keeping out the environment. If one is about sort of manufacturing an environment, the other is about keeping the environment out. Um, and I think part of our interest in the, in the idea of camping um, is, is in a way it gets to the, almost the idea of the sort of primitive hut. Like what is the most essential thing that we need to uh, survive or inhabit uh, in our environment? Um, and we also realize there's a lot of innovations in tents. Like you, you can get just about any shape and form and material of tent. Um, and there's also a lot of innovations on gear. Um, but there is very little innovation when it comes to camp sites. And what's interesting is that we've actually replicated suburban models of housing on our campsites. So um, these are two uh, Canadian campsites and you see the kind of cul-de-sacs and the campgrounds. Um, and, and then the third realization, so I'm Canadian and I'm pretty sure you need to go camping to maintain your Canadian passport. Uh, and I had never been camping. Um, until my husband, who's American, took me. Um, and you know, you imagine you're going out into the wilderness and it's gonna be, you're gonna commune with nature, and then you get there and this is what you see. And you're like, this is not what I signed up for. Um, and so there was this realization that, that camping has become a kind, I mean, they're the hardcore people that, that do go out back and they bring all their gear and they see no one for four days. Uh, and I see someone in the audience who I'm pretty sure is one of those. But, um, but uh, most people actually um, are, are sort of interested in it being a kind of communal activity. And so this was uh, another one of our starting points. So we started by mapping you know, the, the sort of uh, policies and legislation and the kind of advent of the car and all the things that have sort of shaped recreational culture in North America. We mapped out all the sort of technical innovations. Um, and then we, we, we basically, in the sort of spirit of serial responses, um, wanted to imagine five new campgrounds that offered literally new grounds on which you could camp and new experiences. Um, and so since most campsites, if you've ever been to one, they give you a little brochure and they tell you where to go and where to find things, we made our own. Um, we're, we're ready to like market this. Um, and, and for the Biennale, we, um, we decided to kind of document all of this primarily through models. So we, we imagined a kind of site that, that conflated a bit like um, the Seoul Biennale, it's sort of multiple sites in a, in you, I mean, they would never exist this close to each other in real life, but um, five different projects on five uh, different prototypical grounds. And I'll, um, um, and we were interested in the kind of immersive nature of the model also as a potential. So I'm going to show just two or three very quickly, um, again, just to give you the spirit of them. Uh, one was called um, Closed Loop, um, and it was the idea of being able to um, go camping on wetlands and in the middle of lakes, which is, of course, a ground you can't normally uh, occupy, um, but that these are very uh, fragile ecologies. And so the idea was that you would create this kind of collective infrastructure. Um, and the other thing we we're interested in is the kind of rituals of camping. So making a campfire, uh, getting water, um, doing your dishes, setting up your tent. Um, and we were interested in could you reduce the amount of gear you would need to bring. So a lot of the infrastructure sort of built into the campsite. So, um, you know, there were collective fire pits. Um, your tents were actually in this kind of collective curtain. And um, if the curtain was up, you knew it was unused. If it was pulled down, it meant someone was occupying it. Um, there was a kind of artificial wetland um, where you would go and dump your, your sort of dirty water and it would be clean before it was put back into the um, natural water system. And then this was the uh, kind of point for getting fresh water. Um, and, and so this is the kind of manual, uh, the gear you need to bring and don't need to bring, and how many campsites. Um, and the, the model of this, this kind of uh, new ground um, and a view of what it might look like being able to kind of canoe in. So the idea also is that you could leave your car remotely and kind of paddle in or walk in um, and have a kind of much more immersive experience um, with the landscapes. So this is this kind of artificial 
wetland. Um, the second one uh, was called Lookout Tower, and it was the idea of could one take the kind of distributed campsites um, and actually start to kind of stack them vertically um, so that you could get a kind of immersive relationship to the forest. Um, so again, the kind of uh, manual um, and this um, a, a kind of interest in how ephemeral could this tower be. And so again, your tent could actually deploy out of the sort of platform. Each platform was a campsite. Um, and then this kind of very thin mesh that um, simply meant you wouldn't fall out. Um, and then the last one, um, uh, the, or the third of, uh, out of the series of five uh, was called Off Grid, and it was this idea of a kind of endless um, or a grid of poles that had multiple functions. So at the entrance of the campsite, you would get um, uh, the tarps to make your tents, you could get tarps to collect water, um, you could get um, uh, surfaces to, uh, well, actually the surfaces were already built in for Wi-Fi, because one of the strange things about our national Parks is we go to a way to get oh, we go there to get away from it all, but now they're offering you Wi-Fi so you can check your cell phone every few minutes, um, which I, I haven't figured that one out. But anyways, so this idea that you could kind of plug in where you wanted, you could form a cluster with a set of friends, and that these other infrastructures sort of gave you water and uh, electricity and uh, Wi-Fi um, as you needed it. Um, and so this was a, a kind of fragmentary view of the model. Um, Maybe I'll, I'll end, literally this is a super fast one, um, that's a kind of, uh, we've started doing some um, public installations that pick up many of these sort of interests in um, kind of the user being able to kind of uh, engage their environment and, um, uh, and, and engage the, the, the kind of climate. So this was, it's, uh, it was built in Montreal as a temporary installation. It has since traveled all over the world. Um, but downtown Montreal, although fairly vibrant, has a lot of vacant lots. Um, and so the client was interested, um, it was a municipal client, in, in keeping people there uh, year round. And so we were interested in questions of seriality um, in people like the music of Steve Reich, um, in, in images like the cover from Joy Division's Unknown Pleasures, this idea of a kind of um, spatializing sound. Um, the brief asked for um, uh, dealing with sound and light um, to kind of uh, bring people out in the winter. Um, and so we're always interested in can a, sim a simple singular thing be repeated to kind of create variation. So we got interested in the idea of the seesaw as a kind of fairly simple and intuitive thing um, that could allow for formal and informal play. Um, so we built these sort of enormous seesaws um, of different scales that as users interacted with them would emit sound and light. Um, and so it, it formed both a kind of individual ins instrument, but also a collective instrument. Um, and so this is it um, installed in Montreal, all 30 of them. Um, and this kind of new topography that emerges as people um, use it. Um, this is it in the kind of midst of a snowstorm. It was kind of amazing. People came out in all seasons. So I'm going to end with this. So I'm going to end it there, but um, I think for us this, this question of what are the sort of um, territories, I mean this is obviously some of these installations are, are uh, uh, much more local and, and dealing with less complex uh, challenges, but, but I think this kind of ongoing question in how the user um, regardless of kind of scale, becomes part of the sort of, uh, that the architect has to kind of respond to that user as well, um, and, and, and imagine kind of new opportunities is um, a kind of recurrent interest. So I'll end it there. <laughs> <laughs>
before we open it to the audience, uh, I would like to, to ask you about a few things that were very important during your presentation. It's quite an amazing body of work, but also quite an amazing awareness of where you are and how you're situated in the field and what is the challenges that you're introducing. Uh, one of the things that is uh, uh, quite amazing is that you're proposing architecture as a practice that is articulating things that often were seen like very detached to each other, like climate, uh, networks, infrastructures, uh, kind of practices or rituals, you said at one point, performances, are something that is your practices kind of uh, putting together, rearticulating, thinking ways of reassemble uh, or reassembling them. How do you see your practice as kind of uh, something that is operating, uh, kind of connecting or thinking the way these different categories, spatial but also material categories, uh, get together? Um. I mean, I think one of our, part of the answer lies in, in an interest I think we have in um, sort of thinking across scales. And so being able to kind of on the one hand make a map at a, a geographic or, or regional scale um, that understands, you know, whether it's monitoring or m patterns of movement, um, but, but understanding that, that each of those points on a kind of map, regardless of how big it is, has a kind of highly local yeah. reality. And, and I think that that is, um, I, I think that notions of climate or networks, it's really hard to kind of think at a continental scale yeah. uh, or even at the scale of a whole province. Um, but once you sort of recognize that, that these things hit down, um, I think it's, it's easier to kind of then figure out how to engage. And I think that's mm -hmm. where, as architects, we can sort of think about something like climate change or, yep. uh, uh, or networks. Uh, because, we, you know, and I think this is where you can look outside the discipline, but in the end, we're trained to design at a certain scale, and you yep. need to kind of figure out, uh, figure out that territory of operating yep. then as a designer. But, but in a way, I think that's, that's uh, something that is very present in your work. Like there was a moment in more norths that you're saying, but all these realities, they come down to this. Yeah. And you were so in these places. Yeah. And it's a term that has a trajectory in architecture. Like if we were finding where place was basically used, it's very much uh, in a very different tradition. Yep. You also have like a way of reading buildings as something that is very dynamic. For instance, even building configurations or configurations within different, uh, in between different buildings is something that you're describing as something that changes. For instance, many of these Arctic uh, towns, mm -hmm. uh, it's something that you were explaining that was changing in the last years. You were talking also of kind of this materiality that is prepared also for a performance that will make it evolve. So in a way, your focus on buildings is also identifying that buildings are something that are changing, are dynamic, are performing. Yeah. Uh, it's very different to the notion of place as something that is a static, that is kept by buildings, basically. Or yeah. I mean, I think that's an ongoing interest um, that we've had in, in all projects, uh, you know, regardless of whether we're working in the Canadian North. I think in that context where architecture has really been a colonial tool imposed uh, where literally they would, you know, teach Inuit how to live, how to use the kitchen in an appropriate Western manner, um, you know, it's really fraught. And so the idea that, uh, and, and we're not alone, I mean, uh, so social scientists and others are talking about this as well, that, that architecture uh, and housing needs to be flexible, but also in a context when, you know, when you have a, a tiny town of 500 people, um, things have to do double duty or things need to mm -hmm. work in a network. It's, you know, it's, and we're doing work right now in Newfoundland, which is um, not, not as far uh, north, but has a similar condition of many small rural villages. Yeah. Um, it's, it's sort of unimaginable to say every town will get a school and a cultural center and a community center. And so this interest in how things can work as a network and share and distribute, I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, is interesting and hence they have to be dynamic. You know, yeah. and whether that means literally things are reconfigurable or simply that they are 
flexible and can anticipate change over time, uh, you know, different yeah. ways one can understand that, but um, mm -hmm. I think that's an ongoing interest. Um, another topic that I think we sort of miss is the, the, the question of politics. Uh, in many different moments, you were claiming for uh, the field to, to dedicate time to find where its agency could yeah. be gained. Uh, there's moments that you're talking of technology and infrastructures and what's the way to turn them accountable. There's another notion of politics that has to do with, uh, with rendering things visible and even the use of the metaphor of the theater mm -hmm. as a way to expose things and to open them to a public discussion. Mm -hmm. You're talking about new notions of publicness. Yeah. So your, your discuss, or the discussion that you're proposing is very much embedding many different notions of politics, but all of them are kind of embedded within design, embedded in the uh, devices, or in the way all these networks, infrastructures, climates uh, are kind of articulated. Yeah. What is the way that you're working with this, with politics at this point? That's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I, I don't know that the projects are overtly political, but mm -hmm. I do, I mean, we certainly from very early on um, recognized that we were interested in the public realm, yeah. precisely because it is this arena of, you know, whether the public realm is, you know, Montreal yeah. uh, or the North or, uh, you know, a, 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 a place of disassembly of electronics. Um, because I think that, um, I mean, I think part of what's interesting about the public realm is, is the sort of, uh, you have to design for contingency. You can't. Yep. You you don't know what will happen. Whether it's a kind of whether it's an economic change, a cultural change, how a user will will, will or many yeah. users will um, transform the space in kind of unintended and unexpected ways. And so I think that um, this question of how whether it's a building or a public space or a landscape can can be the theater for these things um, uh, has been an ongoing interest. Um, I mean, I think in, in the North, I, I, st I still don't know if the work is political per se, but it certainly uh, wants to be a call to action to say mm -hmm. that design matters um, and, and uh, is a right and um, that we need to kind of uh, recognize the power that design has. Um, mm -hmm. So, so perhaps there, there's a kind of, I'm, I'm not sure that we're reaching any politicians ears yet, but um, there's certainly, um, I, I think the idea that the architect is a kind of advocate, um, is, is important. And I think it, ha you know, many, many architects are doing that in, in different ways. Yeah. So in a way, there's two kind of sides of it in the way that you're explaining it. One is about the role of architects. Uh, a role that it's uh, in the intersection, in your case, of research and activism, but also design. Mm -hmm. Something that is quite unique, I must say, and it's, it's, uh, it's responding to a, a, a kind of external evolutions of the world, but also a, a way that you're, or, or your way of discussing the field, which maybe uh, you can refer to, but there's a second one that has to do with, uh, with evolution of human, uh, funded uh, institutions. Mm -hmm. Like many of the realities you're talking about are kind of questioning uh, nation states, are describing geographies as something that is re being redefined. Mm -hmm. uh, you're working with processes that are also challenging the way politics are institutionalized, like for instance toxicity, and I'm thinking also of uh, Kalambari's work in the Oslo uh, Triennial on the way uh, toxicity was challenging borders, uh, which is something that you shared. So some, somehow by looking at infrastructures and processes like the ones that uh, uh, the e-waste, for instance, mm -hmm. you're also questioning the, the kind of how current uh, uh, nation-based uh, or state-based institutions are when we're dealing with geographies as the ones that you're looking at. So mm -hmm. maybe you can tell us a little bit about these two sides, how things, how many political institutions are sort of uh, being questioned now, and also what is the way that you see uh, the field evolving, in your mm -hmm. case, your position in the field or the way you 
practice uh, um, introducing activism as part of your, your endeavor? I mean, I think, you know, one of the challenges of globalization is that um, so, well, there's a sense that it's sort of at a scale beyond which we can comprehend uh, mm -hmm. and or engage in uh, or have agency in. I mean, I, I don't even mean as architects, I just mean yep. as citizens. Um, and it also, you know, the e-waste one um, sort of makes us most legible where, you know, these things are happening, you know, you, you buy your cell phone, but the materials have come from, you know, China, they've been assembled in, in Holland, they've gone back to Taiwan, you know, like, so the, the sense of where things are made and, and the impacts, uh, whether positive or negative, are very hard to read, uh, which I think was, you know, very different, you know, 50 years ago when you, the shirt you bought was made, <laughs> you know, in, in the city was assembled in the garment district and then you bought it in your local store. So I, I, I mean, I think perhaps one of the things we're interested in, in, in this idea of kind of finding the local is that that is the moment where you can comprehend what is happening and you can also recalibrate it potentially. Yeah. Um, and in that sense, um, you know, I wouldn't be so bombastic to say you can, I'm, I'm not sure you can, I don't know if I want to say you can challenge the global systems, but you can at least sort of perhaps recalibrate them in subtle ways, you know? Yeah. And it, it's the same, uh, you know, argument about sort of political activism that in the yeah. end it happens at the kind of, I think there's increasingly a sense that it happens at the grassroots and at the local, that that's where one has agency. Yeah. And I, I think one could make similar arguments. Um, but how, how do you see your work operating in the discussion of globalization? Because I think that you also propose something different to this vision of the global as a unified uh, 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 system, yeah. uh, even the representation of these uh, interescular relationships are avoiding showing globes, let's say, and it's rather particular, very specific connections that happen to be transterritorial, let's say, yeah. but are very uh, particular, and yeah. in no way they would, you would claim that they're universal. Yeah. So I think that that's something very different to the way globalization was discussed a few years ago. Uh, and, and, and I think, you know, maybe it, in, in some ways it ties to this, you know, the idea of the many Norths that, you know, depending on what you're looking at, um, the territory changes. So even within global networks, you know, the global network uh, for manufacturing a phone is gonna be very different than the yeah. global network and trajectories and points connected uh, in, in buying your kiwi at your local grocery yeah. store. So, so you're right, there's a kind of, um, uh, and, and I think it, it's interesting in light of some of the discussions by you know, Neil Brenner and others, this sort of idea that, you know, where, where there's this desire to kind of map literally the kind of globe as a singular thing. And, and, and I have to say, I find those drawings and maps and the writing fascinating, but, but also slightly disempowering because mm -hmm. uh, when I, I don't know what one does at that scale. And so even to understand, you know, mm -hmm. uh, how, what is the, the international network of your Kiwi, uh, yeah. then one can start to say, well, do I mm -hmm. engage in the farm? Do I engage in the store? Do I engage in its transportation? You know, and you could do that across me. So I, I, I do think this, the global has all sorts of specificities depending on yeah. uh, what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. I really liked your work about the camping site because I do have some, I, I experience similar things. And I was wondering, um, is it, are you, it, are there any like national parks approaching you to like perhaps getting it built and what is the next plan for that? Uh, so it's interesting actually, we, uh, we did the exhibition for the Chicago Biennale and then we showed it at um, University of Toronto um, and it got picked up by the CBC which is I guess like the NPR here and, mm -hmm. um, and then somehow Parks Canada heard about it and they came and, um, and I was having this discussion with one of the students earlier, um, you know in many of these projects I sort of, even I think like we're, we're out there like no one's mm -hmm. going to take this seriously. And then, and they, so we gave them a tour of the exhibition and they said, oh, this is exactly what we've been talking about, which was sort of, uh, <laughs> not reassuring, but, you know, uh, reaffirming is the better word. Um, and so we were in long discussions with them. Um, 
things in uh, all things uh, federal work very slowly and are burdened with multiple layers of bureaucracy that um, uh, so I'm not sure where it's going, if it's going anywhere, but, but it was interesting that they were having very similar discussions about how to kind of transform the experience of uh, the campground. Um, they're doing it at a, at a, you know, more at the scale of like rethinking the sort of, uh, you know, moving from the tent to a, uh, structures and so forth. So, uh, but they were also interested, actually, in these sort of collective infrastructures. So, um, it, there there was a resonance. I, I don't know if it's going anywhere, though. I uh, I wondered if you could comment on the kind of layers of ownership uh, within many of these projects. So, existing again on these international commons, but then dealing with uh, national organizations like uh, Canada National Parks, but also interacting with communities uh, like Native American communities that see themselves or sometimes set themselves apart from these national organizations uh, as their own bodies. And so how do you see these projects, if they do manifest um, in the real world, um, like uh, as physical projects uh, interacting with those layers of ownership? Who builds them and who owns them once they're finished? Mm -hmm. It's an interesting question. So the, and I think we had our eyes um, somewhat opened in the Arctic Food Network, um, which, uh, you know, we developed, it began as a kind of speculative project. We reached out to northern partners and got funding and uh, got a certain amount of buy-in, actually, um, and actually and, and got a an, an second award that basically would have allowed us to pretty much build it, and we could have done all the work, you know, pro bono. Um, and it, it hit a, a few hiccups. One was a question of governance, who was going to maintain it. But I think the larger challenge we realized was... Um, that it, it sort of had to have, this was a project because it was one of the first, like the very early days of our work on the North, at least in terms of design, um, is, is we, you know, we, we did some pretty thorough research <clears throat> and, I, and I still think that it actually resonates with a lot of issues and various NGO groups said, this is right on, but it didn't really come from the community. And I think that that um, was always gonna be a challenge and so, in uh, our work now, um, we partner, you know, from the get-go with, you know, uh, an Inuit group, or we're trying to work on a health center um, in the Northwest Territories with a different indigenous group. And, and you know, I don't know if those will see the light of day, but but I think that you you have to kind of buy trust, even even if the response is right. I think. Um, the, it's, it's a very different process of arriving at an answer. So mm -hmm. in th that would be in, in that case. I mean, I think in, um, uh, in some of these other you know, larger questions like the e-waste, um, I, I think it, one would probably need to do, you'd, you'd need to find sort of stakeholders that are interested and uh, a little bit Forward thinking, and but I think in all these kinds of projects, and you know, and I think this is true of most projects in most places these days, you know, you need endurance, you need there's a lot of kind of negotiation, there's a lot of kind of building trust. Um, there's a and one of the challenges in the north is actually people keep shifting roles, so you go up, you build a connection with someone in charge of, I don't know, you know, housing, and then they leave or they get transferred to some other department and um, but and so you have to kind of rebuild that that sort of trust of like well who are you especially as a southerner you know um, in their eyes um, but yeah I think I think there's a kind of other level of advo advocacy that's almost parallel to the design advocacy yeah. that that is required in in almost any project mm -hmm. anywhere so my question is somewhat sociologic in your description of the Inuit um, communities, I heard no mention of structures dedicated to uh, uh, schooling and education, healthcare, access to healthcare professionals, and uh, uh, access to uh, civic and civil authorities, proximate civic and civil authorities. Would you please elaborate on that? Sure. So, so in fact, a, a lot of the projects we've uh, granted, so in the early days, a lot of the speculative projects we did actually dealt with that, um, both for the Venice Biennale, in fact, the five themes that students and architects worked on, uh, one was healthcare, one was arts and culture, one was recreation, one was housing, and one was 
I'm missing one, but anyways. So, um, uh, and many of our own projects um, have, have looked at this question. So, uh, and, and, and our current work, um, you know, is, is uh, looking, for instance, at a new model of uh, what they call a wellness center, because they, you know, the notion of healthcare is a highly medicalized one in this, in sort of in Canada and in the states, um, whereas their understanding of wellness is is much more of wellness and well-being, and that that intimately ties to kind of culture and being out on the land and transferring knowledge much more than a kind of medical practice. Um, so we're working on. Um, uh, a project with one group on that and, and a similar type of thing um, in Iqaluit. So um, it, those projects are in too early days to, um, to really be able to share, but, but you're right. I mean, these are huge issues. And uh, I, I think the most daunting one, which um, I'm hoping we'll tackle next is housing. And it's the, it's the one that actually slightly scares me, but I, I you know, the, the housing conditions, um, I'm pretty sure from Alaska all the way to Greenland are pretty pretty dire f for many indigenous groups. Well, my question concerns itself with uh, 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 how are yeah, it's medical, important for the recording. How are medical know? emergencies dealt with? Heart attacks, strokes, right. serious injuries, particularly during the time of the year when uh, uh, helicopters or airplanes can't can't reach the uh, uh, affected S people. So not unlike that shipping map. Um, the health map would look not that different, except it would be by plane and medevac. So, um, so for instance, with health, you there are regional centers. Um, in, in, there are a couple of larger northern regional centers, so that would be your first point of call. And then, if you're having a really serious issue, you actually get sent, you know, to Edmonton or Calgary. Um, and and that it has huge cost issues. It has huge. Um, Social issues. So, if you're a woman, for instance, and you need a C-section, which is hardly, you know, that's fairly common, you basically have to get <coughs> sent to Ottawa, you know, which is the equivalent of for you guys being sent to like Mexico to get a C-section. So you're like separated from your family. You're um, you're in a kind of foreign condition. So, and and those are things that we've looked at and we've mapped and and we have done some early, very early in the early days. We did some speculative projects looking at that a little bit. I mean, some of these things, um, I think, have to be recognized are outside the scope of architecture. Some of these are policy issues. Some of them are some of them are just the physical realities that you'll never have a hospital in every community. It's it's physically and cost-wise impossible. Um, but I think considering these things, um, I think, is crucial. And I think it it brings up these opportunities for alternate notions of of health, for instance, which. Mm -hmm. Um, speak to wellness and would require a totally different architecture, which I think is interesting. You know, it wouldn't be a sort of, you know, um, a sanitary, a medicalized notion of a building. It would be um, a, a very different one, which I think um, are untapped opportunities. But in a way, the, uh, these three questions, these three last questions, are uh, showing that uh, from the perspective of your work, uh, traditional. Uh, fields of criticality, like for instance, gender studies or studies of publicness of, or public space or post-colonial studies are something that could be approached from a different perspective, from a territorial one, from a material one that is uh, incorporating networks, distances. Uh, I, I wonder what's the way that that is also kind of uh, fuel back uh, from your work? What is the way that from this very detailed uh, uh, work on particular communities, the, the way they're constituted, their architecture, their infrastructures, uh, there's also an opportunity to contribute, for instance, uh, for the advantage of uh, post-colonial studies, for instance, or gender studies? Um, I think that's an interesting question. Uh, I mean, certainly in, well, not just in Canada. I mean, there's, there's a whole um, strain of, of discourse and research on um, indigenous research methodologies yeah. um, that, that, you know, trans, I mean, whether we're talking about indigenous people in, uh, you know, New Zealand or Canada or uh, America. Um, and I think that the 
the, the idea of sort of decolonizing research exactly. and decolonizing design um, mm -hmm. is, is certainly something that, that we've actually been dealing with uh, much more recently. Yeah. Um, and, and developing sort of new tools. Uh, actually, I realize I didn't even show it on the Arctic Food Network, but we've pushed it further. But you know, tools for even how to engage the community in, in getting feedback and in, in building a kind of conversation yep. about what they might want. And, um, and so changing a little bit the sort of, at least in the early stages, the role of the architect. I mean, at some point, I, mm -hmm. I still think we have expertise that, um, you know, is, is necessary. But, um, but I do think this question of sort of um, decolonizing both how we research and how we then design and i'm and i i would say if i were you know self critical i don't know that the many norths does that yet mm -hmm. i think i think um, it came out of a a very early i mean even though it was a very long and slow project to put together um, i i wonder if we were to do it in 4 years whether some of the drawings or, um, I mean, one thing I didn't say is that there was actually a lot of interviews also um, mm -hmm. with scholars, with indigenous hunters. So there is this idea of, of um, kind of voices on the ground or people that run the plains or build the roads in the north. So, um, so it, it, it starts to do that, but I, I think it would probably get pushed much further. Um, so to bring it back to the beginning of the lecture, you spoke of this idea of the undisciplined practice. Yeah. And I, I wanted to kind of rack your brain on uh, how you would manifest that literally into your own practice. Because if I understand correctly, it's a firm of <coughs> architects. But do you have any kind of goals or hopes of forming a, a super group of people from multiple disciplines able to kind of tackle these larger issues um, yeah. outside the scope of just architecture? I think we um, are interestingly trying to do it, but project by project. Um, I mean, I think that um, you know each each project, each question, each geography um, probably demands its own uh, expertise. You know, so if you were doing a an indigenous health center, you know, in the north, you'd want someone who knew about indigenous health, you'd want elders, you'd want, uh, y you know, uh, geologists, perhaps, I don't know. Um, whereas if you were, you know, doing the um, e-waste project, uh, it would be an entirely, so I, th I think th this interest in kind of tactical collaborations and folding in knowledge um, responding to kind of what's needed um, is more likely than a, a kind of uh, super group. Although um, it is interesting, I've been sort of working on this sort of research proposal um, at my university and realizing there's all these people doing work on the North in completely different disciplines that I had no idea just because they're in other, you know, in other buildings, sometimes in other campuses. Um, and so I think that certainly this idea of building think tanks um, or at least kind of collab, you know, structures for collaboration and ongoing exchange uh, is of interest. Um, but do you think it's also a discussion about uh, the discipline of design uh, or the field of design? Like, uh, because you're very careful also on uh, referring your practice as a research design practice and do you think that there's already the beginning of what could be seen of uh, like a defined field that is finding its vocabulary and uh, it's kind of getting together and uh, having a collective discussion gaining the possibility of accumulating already kind of uh, finds and because that would be really something that could uh, give an amazing dimension to what you're doing. Like mm. this is funding uh, kind of a field, I would say. I mean, I, I actually would love to see, you know, whether it's in the form of simply a conference or, a, a, yeah. you know, a, a network of people that, that had really on, honest conversations about mm -hmm. what design research is. I, we were having this informally, but, um, you know, when you submit your research proposals to social scientists or engineers, um, it's 
it's very humbling um, because they really grill you on what are your methods and what are your theoretical frameworks and what are the outcomes that you anticipate in, in ways not measurable in the sense of you know numerical, but they they're they're trained um, in in ways that are much more precise than I would say uh, at least those of us coming out of design, mm -hmm. um, you know, history theory or uh, material science. I think are, yeah. are different. Um, and we use the, we all use the term, or many of us use the term design research. And, I, and I'm left increasingly wondering, like, what, what do we mean? And I yeah. think to have honest conversations about what is research, uh, as, you know, as versus speculation. Like, for me, yeah. some of these projects are probably more design speculations that ask questions. And, and so it's, it's a fine line for me. Um, I, we like to think about them as research, but I think one could hold oneself to task about that. And, and I, so I think that someone should organize a conference on this, because okay. I think it's an important topic. So we can leave it here. Thank you so much, Lola. Thank it you. was really amazing.